Hello everyone, and welcome to the Rouge Rugby Podcast. Joining me as always is Derek Brissett, and as you can tell by my voice, I am not Dan Murphy, but I am Stu Hardy. Dan has uh, family commitments tonight. Apparently the red Ferrari that he bought last year for his family needs to uh, clock in another thousand miles. So he's uh, headed off to race circuits to do a few laps of that. Uh, Derek, how have you been? Oh man, not too bad. Um, there are obviously tons of tons of fun rugby to watch this past weekend. Um, my girlfriend and I actually we went to go see Black Widow this weekend too okay. at like a drive-in theater. So it was like the first time in probably since like maybe early like February, January 2020 that I've seen a new movie outside of my house. So that was that was kind of exciting. That was a lot of fun. Black Widow is also is also great. Kind of did some kind of weird things with certain characters, but uh, pretty great overall. All right. Okay. Well, uh, speaking of a character that's in red and black, other things that are in red and black is the Canadian national men's team, um, and they played England this past weekend. It wasn't a comfortable scoreline to say the least, no. uh, but uh, seventy fourteen. Uh, I think we all we all knew it was going to be a uh, hiding to say the least, but only fourteen points. It was, uh, yeah, it's a bit tough to watch, wouldn't you say? Um, I mean, yeah, I think uh, we never got your thought. It it's bad, man. You you and Dan flipped which weeks you should have been on the show for. It's uh, we didn't get your we didn't get your thoughts on the Wales game at all. Um. But, you know, I guess I guess that's what you get, man, when you only come on every other week. I don't know. It's, yeah, I suppose so, I'm afraid. But like I said, we still have um, this game. First of all, I want to say the new kit in red. I, you know, being Welsh, I'm always a fan of a red <laughs> kit. So You know what, though? I like these kits a lot because when I looked at them, I'm like, it didn't remind me of Wales kit at all, which I think has been a problem. Yeah, I so think that's... Uh, I, was, I, I really liked it. Go on. What were you going to say? Yeah, well, I think the obviously this is Macron's first kit. Um, I don't know if it's going to be like a similar format for the Olympic Sevens. Uh, probably will be for the um, Sevens coming up in both Vancouver and Edmonton. So we've got that to yeah. look forward to later this year. But um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, there were a very few positives to take from this game. <laughs> However, one of the best positives I would say was uh, Ross Brody's try. Yeah, Ross Brody's try and the kit looked nice. Um, that uh, yeah, I think to be honest with you, I think I think listening to Lucas Rumball in his like on pitch post game interview was basically the perfect thing to sum up this game. Or I think it was the perfect thing to sum up the like how you would review this game and look back on it. And I'm just gonna re like read what he said because I don't want to mess with trying to get world rugby video clips and stuff up on YouTube because that sometimes is a nightmare. Um, so Lucas Rumball being interviewed after the match on the pitch, um, you can I believe you can still watch it on the zone. I think they still have the replay up. So um, feel free if you haven't if you didn't stick around if you shut it off right after the 80 minute, um, you can still go check that out. Um, you can also watch Ellis Genge um, sing some English soccer songs before inevitably probably being very disappointed um, the following day. Mm -hmm. um, either way, Lucas Rumball post game, he said, I think we definitely we can definitely pick some bright spots out of it, but I know I'm pretty disappointed and I know the boys are as well. We talked about raising the bar every week and just building towards the games we have in September and October. And I think we let ourselves down a little bit tonight. And I got to say, it's tough to disagree with that statement. Um, I think the, the interesting thing to me and why I completely agree with it is because these two games, despite so Canada lost this game, 17, 14, and then Wales was 68, 17. So the score lines are pretty similar. The only difference really is a missed conversion and a missed penalty, you know, sp you know, mixed in throughout for both, both the sides. That's, really the only difference is still 10 tries to two um but you know after the wales game i think we all kind of or at least i felt Stu, we didn't really get to talk to you on the show after the wales game but 
I thought after the Wales game, there was there was a little bit of a positive vibe after it, despite what the scoreline said, right? You know, we, we've been hearing a handful of coaches lately saying that sometimes, you know, when you're trying to develop a squad, when you're trying to develop players, it's like the scoreline isn't always the most important thing. And I think that is really illustrated in the Canadian tour um, to the UK, right? Where it's like you have a one, like basically two games where the score was around 68, 70 to 14, seven to like, you know, 14 and 17, right? 10 tries to two on both occasions, but on one game, you feel way better about it than the other. And I think I used, like the previous game against Wales, they tackled well, they were able to hang in the ruck, um, you know, and I mean, guys like Rumball, like was giving, you know, guys like Ross Moriarty, like a bit of a challenge in the rock and stuff, which was brilliant to see um, against Wales. Ben Lesage was a monster. He made every tackle. He was having great carries, um, you know, in, in, and in this game against England, it was like, like the amount of missed tackles alone was, you know, just absolutely staggering. Right. Um, you know, and it, it was just like, not, even remotely close to good enough. Um, like regardless, regardless of who your opposition is, um, you know, it was, they made 102 tackles, right? So England actually made more tackles than Canada in this game, despite having more possession and territory than Canada. Um, England, but they, they made 102 tackles and missed 40 of them, right? Which is 72% according to uh, the stats that were, are up on the England rugby website. Yeah. So, you know, 72%, no matter what your opposition is, is not going to go over well if that's what you're tackling. And I believe in the game against Wales, according to the post-game stats that were posted on the Welsh Rugby Union website, right? Canada was about, I think they were like 86% against Wales. Mm. Despite, you know, they allowed the same amount of tries, but it was like, it was the way that some of these tries were being scored was just kind of like, okay, yeah, like, like you know nobody could make it felt like at times nobody could make a hit right and like almost i think almost everybody in the starting 15 missed a tackle um some guys missed more tackles than they actually made which is also definitely not a great stat line to have to look at post game you know in the ruck too it was like they you know they were that they were losing the ball they were losing turnovers you know it wasn't as you know it wasn't as clean as a performance against wales and it's like i think that's where you go in like the disappointment isn't in the score line it's you go out to what lucas rumball said after the game and it's like the goal of this team like nobody was expecting canada to win either one of these games i don't yeah. think it's a stretch to that's, say that's right? correct yeah yeah so no like and even at that, if Canada lost the game by like 25, we would be like, that's just amazing. Like we, we played so well. I mean, look yeah. how, you know, you kind of look at uh, the Eagles played very well against England and like they, they still lost that game by like, by like 15, 15, 20 or so. Um, right. But it was like the, the, at the mood after that Eagles game against England was very positive because, you know, they had an amazing second half where they scored tries and they brought the score line up to, you know, quite respectable, regardless of who your opposition is. Right. Mm. And I think like in this game, it was just everything that was kind of positive about Canada against Wales was kind of taken away. Guys were missing tackles. There was that one restart where everyone was offside. Yeah. On, like on the restart, um, which I honestly do not think I have ever seen in test rugby. No, that like, was something I was just like, how are you getting this thing so wrong? Yeah. Like, and, 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 and if it was a case of like, Oh, you hadn't played any rugby since 2019, I'd be like, okay, dude, brain fart. Fine. Yeah. But have this we, is, this isn't even club level. This is yeah. like in the train club training level mistake. Yeah, this is it was it was ridiculous to see and see it yeah it was just yeah I, I I agree like that's this is see I was like when I watched it I was like really like like we're just like what we're doing now it's kind of speechless like you're describing like yeah how do you go offside like 
I, your one job is to stay behind the kicker on that play. Like that's all you, and it wasn't even the fact like the restarts sometimes get botched. I like, I yeah. can forgive if the kick doesn't go 10. Yeah. If the, kick or it goes, goes straight out, it goes out on the full, like yeah. whatever it, it like that happens. We see that happens. Sometimes you misjudge it. Sometimes, you know, the, the 10 or whoever's kicking, maybe, maybe you're just having a bad day. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. I'm not concerned about it. I'm not over. Why? Well, I mean, it shouldn't like, you don't want that to happen. And maybe the coach would be concerned about it, but I wouldn't make a big deal out of it. Like we are kind of this where it's yeah. like, yeah, you went, you're offside though. Like yeah. it, it's, it's one of those things that's like, man, how do you, how do you make that mistake? You know? Um, so that was kind of tough. That was tough to watch. Um, but like, yeah. And then obviously, you know, other things, it's like, I think, you know, you kind of do see things that Canada's got to work on too. Um, mall defense. I don't know if it's just uh, Wales or sorry, excuse me. I don't know if it's just like England is bigger, faster, stronger, you know, better facial hair because <laughs> the mighty ducks must be quoted on our podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I don't know what, what it is about them, but if like the mall the mall barely like it didn't even look like it was there sometimes it was just like as soon as they went to for that five meter line out yeah it was, it was like over. you're really like this is a this is a try like i we can you can i don't even need to watch this so like you know yeah. it's it's gonna roll over and it did often right yeah um and i mean that's it you know i think i think part of part of it i think is obviously tier one team kind of beating down a tier two team yeah um but it's also like i felt good about the way that they played against wales despite losing 10 tries to two despite losing by like you know 50 plus points this game this is this is very like i said very similar score line but the way they got there was completely different and it kind of you know what i mean like it kind of makes you kind of question like not question but it does make you like worry a little bit um because you got to be able to string like you got to be able to build towards a positive thing i don't think it was necessarily all doom and gloom as we're kind of making it out the sound here yeah um i think you know when canada actually got the ball in hand um they did some very good things with it i thought the the attack Mm -hmm. definitely had moments um ben lesage um, on this tour, Canada scored four tries. Lesage has assists on three of them. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, that's brilliant. Um, he's been playing really well. Um, Kainoa Lloyd, um, I don't like, I don't know how he doesn't have an MLR contract for next year based, just based on these two games. He's been arguably, it's, it's weird looking at, I think you could probably make an argument that Canada's two best players in this game ha- don't play in Major League Rugby over the tour. I mean, like, I think you can make an argument that it's Kainoa Lloyd and Cooper Coates were the, yeah. the two best players. I don't know. Do you have anybody else over the tour who you, um, would, who you would put in that conversation? Who's Canada's best player over the two games? Well, I would say that um, Lucas, uh, Lucas Rumble had, of course. yeah. Yeah. Great work. But um, yeah, obviously I think when it comes from a, like either neutral or a casual fans point of view, and you're only looking at the tries, then yeah. Yeah. Um, Kanoa Lloyd and uh, Massage. Something I want to mention is um, I think that uh, what's his name? Uh, Craig Evans, who was a referee, had a fairly good game, apart from one major incident, which was Lewis Ludlow's yellow card, which was Ooh, a knee yeah. to the face. That should have been a red, but you know, it's out of our control. And um, yeah, and Il- it- Il- Mickey didn't come back from in the game. Ex- yeah, exactly. I don't know. Maybe maybe it was like just precaution because like, why do you want to risk an injury in this but absolutely that was that was a knee that would make uh john jones proud though yeah but at the same time it's like i i know that ben whitehouse was the tmo and he should have just said there and then that and because for craig evans it was his it was his first test as the man in the middle so yeah i think and also that yeah and, and he did well and you know he can make mistakes um i would just like to pivot slightly onto um our neighbors south of the border um, because after their performance against England last week, every people were kind of thinking like, oh, are we going to get more of the same? And uh, no. Um, 
So I think if Canada can take away one thing from uh, this tour is that they outscored the United States in the second week <laughs> just, just by um, getting another try and the conversion. Yeah. But um, this, I think this is a big snap back to reality, not just for the US, but for tier two nations. I think someone, I think it was for the 15, um, and the quote was, is that... COVID has already stretched like the rich tier one nations to a near breaking point. But for tier two nations, they've been set back a decade. And I think that is very, very true. I mean, if you even look at like New Zealand, who put a century past Tonga, because it was a... Tonga um, was missing so many guys. Yeah, so so many guys were missing. They had to call mm -hmm. up guys that are in like club, in like amateur or semi-pro yeah. scenarios. And you know, congratulations to them for obviously yeah, that getting their first cap. But this I didn't is watch that game. I didn't even bother to watch it once I saw the score line. I was just like, yeah, because it's. Uh, I think it was one, two, three, four, uh, I don't know, six. Um, so one player scored five tries in that game. Who? That was one player. That was um, Will Jordan. Yeah. For news. Um, one, two, three, four, five. I was gonna say, how good was ten. the all, how I didn't yeah, how good was the All Black squad that they actually put out there for? Like, what's your assessment of it? Uh, I think it was a very strong side because again, this oh, is was a it? so uh, this fullback. No Damian mercy McKen from them, eh? like they're uh, Richie Mwanga as um, starting fly half, who was on the bench. Uh, oh, Bowden Barrett. Oh, good um, lord. Geordie oh. Barrett was on the bench for fullback. Because the starting fullback was Damian McKenzie, um, Reiko Ioane, um, Sam Whitelock captaining at um, uh, number five. Uh, Dane Coles, yeah, Dane Coles scored uh, or did like a monster run, I think, oh, so in that game as well. Typical Dane Coles game then. Yeah. Um, no, well, obviously this is the um, first test that the All Blacks have had in 2021. Mm. Um, yeah, it were it, they did not take it lightly at all. Yeah. They were like, I think, um, I'm just trying to say, there's only four players that got their first caps for New Zealand in that match. Yeah, is what it is. I think um, going back to that USA Ireland game, um, from a Canadian perspective, the most like maybe not the most noteworthy thing, but certainly a noteworthy thing from that game is that Reichert Hadding got suspended for a hit no, like you know a shoulder hit to the head of the irish hooker and you know so that suspension is going to be four games uh, which means he's going to miss the first leg of the canada usa world cup qualifier home and home what would the other games be i know i guess it would be the other he's missing he's Seattle. missing the last sea wolves game yeah and then there's two other like um hold on i i gotta pull up the um uh, I've got the America's Rugby News. Yeah, so uh, that's exactly what I was going to pull up. There's two other like club games or something mixed in there that are going to count towards a suspension. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, so Houston versus Seattle, he'll miss. Yeah. The National Sevens Tournament and mm -hmm. Seattle Rugby Club versus Bend. And then the first test in oh, Canada. First test. So, yeah, you know, I think there's always been like contention of like if you get. <laughs> uh, if you get a suspension at international level, it's then an umbrella term, so it has to match international level as well. Hey, man, the rules are rules. I'm not. But, that's yeah. what he's suspended for. That's what he's suspended yeah, for. Yeah, they don't pay me enough to uh, yeah. correct these wrongs. But, um, um, but yeah, so he's he's out. So that's a. I think that's that's a pretty big loss for the United States. Um, I guess uh, he might have, I mean, perhaps used his 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 brief time off to sign a new contract. Yeah. As well as that was that was announced what half an hour ago before we started recording. Yeah, just um, half an hour. He's uh, now signed for the Sea Wolves until twenty twenty three. So that's nice. two years. I kind of I kind of love that the I love that the Sea Wolves announced that. Like it's cool to get the, uh, you know, some some of that that early earlier contract news and stuff, mm -hmm. and have some term in the in the announcement. I liked. I, I thought the mm -hmm. uh, they did pretty well with that announcement and stuff. It's a good way to kind of build hype as you're uh, very, you know subpar season kind of comes to an end here well we're going to be talking about uh, other contracts and uh, people moving into certain positions 
But as we uh, touched upon with MLR, I think it's also now time to touch upon the final um, tr- the final game for the Toronto Road Warriors. As it was, yeah. Against uh, uh, New England, who had um, the day before been eliminated from playoff contention uh, mm-hmm. by New York getting not only the win, but any bonus point. Yeah, thanks, um, Houston. Either way... Um, New, yeah. New England really had an outside shot of making the playoffs going into this week anyway. So it was like, yeah, as it, it, it was one of those things like, so there's a chance, oh, there's a chance. as opposed to, yeah, but... okay, we need to do this and this. Um, but ultimately New England, uh, New England could have won both of the last two games of their season, a hundred to nothing. And yeah, it still wouldn't, have made it still wouldn't, it still wouldn't matter. Yeah. Either way. So, it was uh, the final score, I believe, was 17 to 28 to New England, who now have the double against Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, of course, I think I think um, Toronto had like half a one eye on the game and one eye on the airport, willing to just go home because they're like, it does it doesn't matter at this point. <laughs> Again, like you said, they could have, they could have won a hundred nil, wouldn't have made a blind lick of difference. Um, and I think, uh, but the, I'll be honest, it was obviously Sam Malcolm got the scoring started and then kept New England back for thirty minutes until, and then there was obviously uh, two quick tries from the driving mall, and from there it obviously just didn't click. And then of course, well, actually they only scored three of their tries. Uh, one was a knock-on that somehow <laughs> became a oh, yeah. fault. For... I think the uh, that that was tough because I think on that play that we're talking about a Barlow's try, right? Yeah, um, I think on, on that play, like it looked like Wakanabu definitely tr- like tried to pass that, tried to offload it as Montero hit him, and then I think Derek Summers was going to call it a knock-on, and then the AR said that he he's saw his knocked on in the tackle yeah um and then at that point it's it's one of those things that's like that's tough because now you put Derek Summers in a really tough spot and he has to go with his AR guy yeah um so i mean like that's like it, it's it's one of those things though where see, i see i think i i disagree with you in saying that they had like one eye on the airport because they you know, they, they played like full out in this game. You look at like Oh no, that was when that was when their eyes were firmly on the game. It was just there were some instances where you know concentration slipped and they, again I guess that's yeah, down to that's, more that's, that's down more to fatigue. I mean Sam Malcolm's try saving tackle and the, and the final try saving tackle. Alec, yeah, exactly. Alex Russell like, you know, busting his butt all the way to the, the final whistle there to like like you said, it's like I think I think that's one of those things that it's like I think is great about this team is it's like yeah that that play probably would have been easy for everybody to just you know all right season's done just, yeah. there's another try but no like Russell I maybe maybe you know maybe it's you know the guy that's only been there for two weeks you know just you know presses the accelerator and goes and hunts down Conradi makes a yeah. great tackle gets to the knock on too. And it was like, yeah, like they, th- there's one thing you definitely can't question with this team is the heart. And they, yeah. uh, you know, they, w- they went, they gave it their all, all the way through to the final whistle in this, in this season. Mm. Um, I do think, yeah. So, you know, looking at like the actual game itself, I think, and back to that AR call too, it's, I think this game, like, I think looking back at this season, and I'm kind of like, you know, once, you know, once the MLR season kind of wraps up, I kind of want to, you know, go back and watch, you know, all the arrows games from the year and just kind of be like, I feel like there's so many games that were just like the arrows were in it or arguably the better team at certain points. And then something happens and like the tide turned and, you know, like if you look, look at this game and you go through like all the stats, um, for this for this game and it's like the vast majority of the stats in this game favored the toronto arrows yeah like the vast the vast majority of them did 
right? And like, and I think it was so at halftime, right? The arrows had sixty. Uh, the stats posted on like during the halftime, like the graphic at halftime. So if something got updated since that graphic at halftime, then sorry, but the graphic at halftime is what I'm going <laughs> off. Of. Right. So the graphic at halftime said that the arrows had 67% territory, 57% possession, and you're losing 14 to three. Right. Um, you know, at the end of the half and like the reason you're losing 14 to three too, is it's like, it, 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 you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you do, like I said, you do everything right. So, um, right. Where it's like, you're controlling the possession, you're controlling the territory. Right. Um, and then, Wakanabu gets a break, a steal in the breakdown, causes a turnover. Right, the free jacks quickly go up the other way. Eventually, you know, there's eventually there's a penalty or whatever. I saw some some fans online didn't like a couple of the passes that were made, you know, on that play, but you know, so be it at this point. Yeah. Um, but it was like they they so they march all the way down the field. They get a some eventually there's a penalty called. They kick to the corner and drive them all over. Right. So it was like the free Jacks took the one shot that they had to score and scored on it. Yeah. Right. Created from a turnover by uh, Wakanabu. And then a couple minutes later, it's very similar play. The arrows are in the free Jacks territory. Joe Johnston gets a steal and like, not even like they're earning penalties in the rock, like cleanly, like they're pulling the ball out yeah. and are able to counter attack. Like, nice proper clean turnover turnovers and you know they again they take the ball they move up arrows get a couple penalties the penalties allow them to kick to the corner and they drive them all over mm. right and then it's and it was just like so you looked at that end of the half the arrows did absolutely everything right except they had two turnovers that new england turned into 14 points within a matter yeah. of minutes um and i think like you know, kind of looking looking at like the course of this, uh, looking at all the stats from this game. Oh, Stu, am I losing you here? You're too hot and shutting down. Yeah. I have no, that has never happened to me before. I'm, I'm sorry, it just this. Yeah, <laughs> I was just saying maybe maybe you gotta turn. Do you gotta turn on like an air conditioner or something, Stu? Uh, let me get a just, fan going. Yeah, let me just try and get the fan going. But the camera, the camera's too hot. Is that is that um, uh, is that a sign of like my how my takes have been so far? <laughs> All right, Stu, you're back. All right. So, um, did you uh, did you get everything fixed? Is your uh, your uh, camera no longer too hot for? Uh... We we shall find out soon enough. All right. All right. Well, glad to hear it. Okay. So, as I was saying, like the arrows had. You know, they they were the better. They had more carries. They had more meters. Um, you know, they had a lot more. You know, the uh, the territory immense. Even at the end of the game, they were still over sixty one percent territory um, possession. It was just everything that the arrows could have done. They they probably they probably did. The big difference in this game to me, um, when you look at the stats, is that. The Toronto had 16 turnovers conceded to New England's 13, which doesn't isn't that big of a difference. The big stat, though, which is something that the arrows probably aren't too used to being on the losing end of, but New England had six breakdown steals to Toronto's one. This um, is what happens when Lucas Rumble when Lucas is, Rumble. Uh, is See, the though, national team. Okay, so that's that's kind of the other the other thing to I think to kind of bring up too, um, because I think you know and and I know I mean we'll we'll kind of talk about the uh, a little bit about the uh, the arrows in general um, in a minute and stuff, but I feel like you know just because all the time like we always talk about just how nuts like Lucas Rumball's breakdown steal stats have been right um, over the course of the season. And, you know, obviously he had, he's had at times double more than double the next guy um, in the league. And, you know, in, in some cases he's had more than the next guy in the league plus like the, um, the next guy in the league plus the third best guy in the league. But it's like, it's crazy 
to look at like part of why this game i think i thought was fun because the battle in the breakdown was awesome um new england i guess got the got the edge in it but it's like rumble leads the league the guy behind him is joe johnston who in rumble's absence during this game happily cut rumble's lead a little bit um the guy behind johnston is della vega who added who you know had a had the one steal for the arrows in this one and then after that like jackson thebes is top five um Poasa wakanabu is top five um eric de Jager is top five like the actual wayne conradi is up there like the act like the actual like new england leads the league in breakdown steals but if you kind of look at it it's like by committee yeah where it's like you know toronto has like rumble and della vega have the lion's share of the toronto steals obviously rumble rumble stats are ridiculous man yeah like there's teams that i think what was it? up until like three weeks ago rumble had more breakdown steals than utah yeah. um and and utah caught rumble because rumble is not playing anymore um but like like yeah, but like New England's one of the best in the league at this. Like if you look at the breakdown steal, like the the top like twenty five players is littered with um, New England guys, um, which was you know something that they that despite kind of being on the wrong end of most of the categories in this game, they were able to win win get breakdown steals. They were able to create turnovers, and when they did that, despite like I said, despite having like you know very little possession and territory numbers, right? Very little time with the ball in hand. They they created turnovers and then made the most out of it, right? And I mean, e- even with that that one try that we'll say had, had the questionable knock-on call, um, right? So it's like, you know, even questionable call aside, it's like, yeah, they, they took advantage of the turnovers that were given to them, right? And and I, I like, I don't know. I think sometimes it it's... I think some some of those these games that the arrows have played this year, um, because I think, you know, regardless of what you say, so obviously the season's over now, mm-hmm. right? They finish five and eleven, but th- like, is there anybody out there that actually thinks this team is what their record is? Oh hell no! Yeah, like, like, e- even yeah. even the other teams exactly. have acknowledged that the effort and the work that has oh, come yeah, in exactly like la put out a tweet saying uh thank you uh toronto yeah. oh, for so playing. many teams did. I saw brennan sparks was like one of the first guys to put something out after the game ended yeah um like you know the messages began kind of pouring in right and i think that's but you know and obviously like the team has been through a lot living in atlanta and stuff and i think there are some games that i kind of look back on it and it's just it's like man luck Luck kind of matters sometimes in sports, especially sports with a funny shaped ball that can bounce weird ways. Oh, yeah. After the Utah Atlanta game, it's a sport that can sometimes be decided by a bounce, and that can only be, yeah. it will bounce a certain way, and it can only be millimeters from being yeah, yeah. in your hands or in your opposition okay. hands running in to score a try. And, and, and I think, in all honesty, I think that's kind of like the case with the arrows in a lot of ways. It's like, you kind of look at it and I mean, there's a reason you have to actually play the games, right? Cause it's like, yeah, you know, on paper doesn't, doesn't mean everything. Um, but it's like, there's, there's a handful of games. I think you kind of look back on like, like this game here, the game, the game against New York with the uh, Thaka Balavu tr- um, try that was like, wow, yeah. was and it was like, there's some games where you're just kind of like, man, they just, they can't get a bounce. Yeah. Like, and it was just like, it's, you know, and I think you kind of go back through some of the, like how many other losses were by less than seven still. Oh god! Like they racked up. The, they weirdly racked up those losing bonus points, right? Yeah. Um, I think was this. I think this was like one of like the few losses that was by more than seven. Yeah. Let me just uh, get a quick look. Yeah, so, so do you have that number? How many games did they actually lose by uh, less than seven? Like less than seven. Um, five. Five of the eleven was by um, less than seven, mm. and eight was by fewer than eleven. I think the point though that I'm trying to make is like. I think you kind of look at back at some of the losses and I think there's definitely like they could have won that game. They should have won that game or yeah. the stat lines would suggest that they would. Um, I, I just, I think, you know, kind of looking. Yeah. It's just, the team is so 
is so good. And I mean, like you look across like the, you know, the, the statistical categories for like individual players, Lucas rumble is at the top of like everything. Um, ben Lesage is at the top of a lot of categories. Diana Della Vega are at the top of a lot of categories. Taylor Adams, you know, despite also not, you know, playing a lot of the second half of the season is still like one of the league's like leading scorers. And I think, you know, the I think just the fact that the team had to be on the road, living out of a hotel in Atlanta, definitely, you know, took a toll um, on, yeah. on the players, on the staff, on everybody involved in the organization. And it's like, you know, everything that they the team had to go through just to make this season happen, like you have to applaud what they did just to complete the season. Um, especially like, you know, Mark Winokur finding guys to come in for the last couple of weeks, you know, as yeah. they dealt with injuries and they dealt with all 13 guys leaving for international duty. Um, oh, six, yeah, 13. Yeah, 13. 13, 13, 13, 13 total, including yeah. the uh, Uruguayans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, you know, you just have to kind of applaud, I think, what this team did this year because it was – you know, regardless of what the record said at the end, it's amazing. And, you know, I think if you really, if you break down the team too, like from an analytic point of view, like, like you said at the start of this conversation, the, nobody thinks the Toronto Arrows are a five and 11 team. No, like that's just not what they are. Like the Toronto Arrows are a lot closer to that game where they slaughtered New York than yeah. they are to, you know, even this game where they lost to the free Jacks. Or, you know, the game they lost to L.A. Or even the game, even the, the loss to L.A. Like, Toronto was played with L.A. up until that yellow card. And that yellow card was the downfall. But everything outside of that 10-minute window of the yellow card, the stats in that game were pretty even. Yeah. Right? Like, Toronto, Toronto can be one of the best teams in Major League Rugby. And I think, like, I would love to, in all honesty, I would love to be able to find a website or some sort of bookie or something that would be like, I just let you place a bet on the 2022 MLR shield champions. Yeah. Because I feel like, you know, if you finish last in their conference, you probably aren't getting the best odds, but yeah. you know, but I mean, yeah. so but that's it. We but know, we know money, the smart money. I feel like might be on, uh, on the Toronto arrows to win yeah. the shield next year. And I think the one thing, just like especially things, I think uh, Brian Ray kind of had, um, or America's Rugby News had a little bit of an article that suggested, seemed to suggest that the bulk of the core is going to come back, and if the core is back and they're able to play home games, they're able to have those comforts of you know sleeping in your own bed, you know being able to you know be with family, see your friends, see your family, see maybe like your fr your friends from like different circles of life that aren't necessarily rugby and get away from the game for a minute instead yeah. of just always being around your teammates and your coaches. Yeah. Um, being able to do a lot of, you know, being able to kind of unwind a little bit and enjoy it. Being able to play in front of fans, your own yeah. fans eight times in a season. Um, and you know, and also not to, to not lose 13 guys to an internet yeah. window as well. Yeah. Um, you know, if that comes back, man, like I would still be, I still think that they're one of the, the best teams in major league rugby. It's just, I think, I think the circumstances that they had to play in, uh, yeah. were obviously incredibly challenging and everything that the team went through, you have to commend, you know, just their ability to finish out the season. But I wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't. If you say if you if someone were to say like right now the Toronto Arrows win the Shield in 2022, that I would not be surprised by that statement. If no. there was some sort of like Loki esque time traveler that came back here and was like, yeah, the Arrows win the Shield next year, I'd be like, yep, yeah, that makes sense. Um, right. So I think like it's it's it was obviously an incredibly challenging season, but I think like you know looking back at this team, um, they're way better than um, what the record suggests and. You know, hope like the first home game for the Arrows. I don't like, regardless of whatever whatever stadium it ends up being at. Yeah, it could be Fletcher's Field. Yeah, it, dude, it could but, be. I don't. It could be a parking lot next to yeah. Love Laws. I don't care. Um, it's it like the you know what I mean like the next the next Arrows home game, regardless of what stadium it's at, regardless of what, as long as it's a patch of grass, it's got some posts, 
Yeah. I think, you know, the, Saw that uh, will bring the bear. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. The crowd, the crowd will be amped up Huge. for that. It's been, yeah. it's been so like, even, even like they didn't play a home game in 2020 either. Yeah. Right? It's like, by the time it, that the hours come back, it'll be close yeah. to three years. Yeah. They played it's, it'll be nuts. It'll be nuts. And that, that first home game, man, like that, the atmosphere for that game is going to be absolutely insane just to be able to, yeah. you know, to welcome the team back and, I think I think it was it's been great to see a lot of like you know the, some of the posts on social media of guys returning home and stuff and the families yeah. kind of welcoming them welcoming them back. Um, I hope you know I hope I hope everybody gets I know you know I know there's like there's a draft and stuff to prepare for too and you know they probably got to do like you know I think they already did like their exit interviews and stuff like that but I mean like. You know, there's obviously going to be like you know contracts and stuff to resign, but I hope, I hope everybody kind of gets that little chance to like, even like the guys that are playing for Team Canada, um, and have to kind of prepare for the the qual. I hope everyone just kind of gets a little bit of a chance to unwind. Yeah, it, um, after that, because that obviously would have been stressful. Um, and yeah, like I like I think it, it's tough because I think for at least from for me. Like this was a year where, you know, Ontario being locked down, it was kind of like, at least for like, for me, it was like, wake up, go to work, come home. Yeah. And there was no, there was nothing else. Like there was nothing else to, to do. Right. It was, you know, life, life just kind of became wake up, go to work, come home, wake up, go to work, come home. Right. And I think like the Toronto arrows playing the season, right. It, you know, it gave you, I think uh, for me anyway, Stu, I don't like, you know get your thoughts on this too but it, like for me like it gave me something to like look forward to on the weekend yeah. um which you know is it was amazing right and um you know all, all all i think all at this point you can really do like you know re- like i said it's like regardless of what the record is i think i just kind of want to like thank everybody at the toronto arrows organization for just you know making making those sacrifices of moving you know 1500 kilometers away from home um you know setting up camp in atlanta and you know making it through the 2021 mlr season um you know as um it's pretty pretty remarkable feat just to to finish out the year right and you know and uh like like i said i think it gave myself and probably a lot of other fans just something something to look forward to while you know especially during a time where you know, there really wasn't a whole lot to do other than, like I said, go to work and maybe you can go on a walk or something. Yeah. Like that was about it for like your entertainment outside of your house, right? So, yeah. Um, I don't like it's uh, you know, the results weren't necessarily what what you wanted, but you know, given the tough circumstances, like I don't think anybody can be too too upset about it and. You know, hopefully, hopefully they, like you said, hopefully they keep that core of the team together. Hopefully they're able to return to Toronto. And with this team, like with this team being able to play home games, stuff being able to come back, like, you know, hopefully they can, uh, they can make a run at the shield next year because, you know, there's, there's really no reason that they can't. And like, it's like, even like the full season stats right now, so like everything about the st- statistics and like the analysis and numbers that I've seen, like nothing points to a team that should be last in the league. Of no. course, like numbers, numbers don't account for outside situations and, you know, maybe like the mental aspect and stuff. They just kind of account for what you kind of do on the pitch or whatever. But um, like, yeah, like I, I don't see why they can't make a run at the shield next year. And, you know, especially, um, if, if the league, because the league initially when Dallas was there was going to use a different playoff format, there was going to be yeah, gonna there was be... going to be three teams in each conference make the playoffs. So if they go back to that, kind of opens that up. Like, I don't see why they can't do it. Um, and, uh, you know, that, wouldn't that be like the sweetest thing after, though, is to, you know, to come home or like, you know, next season be able to play home games. And, you know, after a, after a full almost what feels like two years without having the Arrows play a game in Toronto can get like you know maybe a, you know have them play outstanding have them play outstanding at home get a couple home playoff games and stuff next year i think that would be uh 
Because I mean, you got to you got to make up for all the home games that you missed, right? So I think next yeah. year you might, as, might as well give the fans at least an extra two next year, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And on top of that, no more home games that aren't in Toronto. No, yeah, exactly. As in, not we're not going to Nola. We're not going to Las Vegas. It's Toronto or bus. Playing play the snow. I don't care. Playing yeah. Toronto. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing is that the fact that this season happened at all is remarkable. Yeah. No, that's the victory because yeah. it could have been, they could have done the same thing as Dallas. They could have said, ah, you know, border issues. We can't host it. Therefore, we're not going to compete this year. They could have easily just walked away and there'd be 11 teams playing in MLR this season. But they uh, saw the options. They, uh, knew that there would be uh, four months away from home for the majority of the players, and they went with it. And, you know, I, again, I'd like to thank uh, Bill Webb, uh, Mark Winneker, uh Chris Silverthorne, uh, the entire uh, background staff, that include, uh, even uh, Coco, the performance analysis, went down for the final few games of the season as well, but also like Sean Harrison, uh, Perry Fan, Scott Shannon, um, all the coaches as well. Even uh, this guy called Rob, who was only there for three weeks. Um, <laughs> uh, but obviously, um, Aaron Carpenter, Corey Hector, Peter Smith, uh, Dave Butcher as well. And all the uh, guys behind the scenes who have like been in Toronto, who have been like handling social media, handling uh, requests and things like that. Um, yeah, all of you are, have, we all appreciate you. And we appreciate each and every one of you for what you've done. because. The easy option would have been to say, ah, we'll see you in 2022. But you took the challenge, you faced it. Obviously, we wish you had uh, been in a position where you could have been playing home games or playing for the Shield. But the fact that you did it as a whole is remarkable. Like I, I cannot think of any other team in rugby or in sport that would separate from their families for four months um, for this competition so for that we are grateful and thank you yeah that's i i mean that's really all you can say it's just uh yeah thanks thanks to everybody i'll just echo that same thing there still like, thanks to everybody that uh you know helped uh help make that happen i think um you know also got to mention uh, i think Stu, you got to mention brock smith too just for helping hook us up with a oh uh, yeah couple of the interviews and stuff that we've done over the course of the year too um it's um yeah, like to all the players, everybody that, you know, wore the Arrows jersey this year, whether it was for one game or for 16, there's nothing you can really just say but thanks because I don't think it's yeah. uh, like... Well, well, we'll show our thanks at the first home game. Yeah. If, and even if there's the opportunity of hosting some, like, games in the fall before it gets oh. too cold. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be there. We'll be there cheering and drinking and yelling and... It could, it doesn't even have to be against another MLR team. It could be against, uh, you know, the elementary school opposite me there, first 15. Yeah. And oh, we'll be well, the, that. That'll have it look like that South Park episode where the kids have to Absolutely. call it Absolutely. Avalanche. Yeah. But we'll, we'll be there um, with bells and whistles and maybe cowbells. Uh, right. Now we've got some other uh, MLR news to do, even though, you know, the, the arrows aren't in it anymore. So who cares? Um, but uh, yeah, uh, but this thing on to um, rock, uninteresting whatever, news. whatever competition Rock Nation is running, that's what we're gonna yeah. watch now. Yeah. Um, so three teams did confirm their playoff spots. Um, Utah's lose uh, try bonus points, sorry, um, against Atlanta ensured that they would be the um, team alongside LA for the Western Conference final. Um, LA uh, now, uh cannot be dethroned they will be hosting and the final will, and their conference final will be at the coliseum um atlanta with their bonus point victory have secured their place in the um, eastern conference final and although new york and new orleans technically um well new york could technically um get a bonus point win to match atlanta the point differential is substantial so it looks as though uh the eastern conference final will be in marietta um there's also been more information released on the championship final uh where the mlr shield will be uh done for and that is going to be uh located 
on all overall standings. So currently, if you were to put both conferences together, we would have LA as number one, then Atlanta as number two, uh, Utah as number three, and currently it is New York as number four. Now, obviously, this is probably going to change depending on the final uh, week, the final round of the season. So all we know at the moment is that um, LA are definitely first and Atlanta are definitely second. So this means that if LA was to win their conference final, they would then host the championship final at uh, the Coliseum as well, or a stadium of their choice. So far, would be nice, but you know we'll take what we can. However, if LA were to lose and Atlanta was to win, then Atlanta would host the final. And if both were to lose, well, we can't really tell at this point because of the final round to go, and it may be an upset, in which case New York um, usurps Utah. But uh, for now, we'll just leave it at those two things. So if LA wins uh, their conference final, it'll be going to LA. And if Atlanta wins and LA loses, the conference final will be going to Atlanta. Uh, Derek, what do you make of this? Because I know that the we've had the championship final in the West um, so far. So we had it in 2018 and we had it in 2019 as well. Now that we've got these divisions opened up, I was hoping that we could maybe do like a one year It'll be the uh, Western team that hosts the final and the other year the Eastern team that hosts the final. Um, but, but what do you think of this as yeah, in like the this. overall ranking? Yeah, um, I like it, Manny. Um, you know, unless you're going to, I think unless you're going to do something like the Grey Cup or the Super Bowl where you are predetermining which, you know, si- which city is going to host it, um, the standings is 100% the way to go. Um, so unless, like, like I said, unless you're making that decision to be like, we want to, you know, we want to plan like a huge party. We want to make like a whole week about it, like Grey Cup week. Um, you know, if, if you want to have something like that, then I think it, then sure, like you can maybe pick which, you know, cities that you want to go to and maybe balance out the East versus West thing. But uh, if you're not doing that, the standings are 100% the way to go. Um, the highest seed team, like that's that's what you get should get for the being the highest C team. You get home field advantage in the final. Um, if it happens to be that three, four, five, 10, 15, 50 years in a row, it's going to be a team in the Western Conference, then so be it. Right. That the Eastern teams gotta gotta kind of you gotta earn it, right? Um, so I think I think it's I think it's fair. I would like to see it. the Coliseum too, if it ends, if it does end up that this is how the dice falls and ends up at the Coliseum. Um, what a cool venue to host an MLR final. Um, hopefully they can get the crowd that would be able to match that. Um, of course, though, they got to get. I think the one thing that your situations are missing yeah. out here is they have to get there first. Um, so Utah or in theory, I guess in theory, NOLA could technically host or I guess Nola probably couldn't. Nola would probably have a hard time because I feel like they're going to be the lowest ranked of anybody. And also, well, they have a very challenging way to actually get into the final, or even into the playoffs. But um, yeah, Stu, like I mean, I think um, your analysis of what can happen there for the final um, was very good. But it is also kind of operating under the assumption. You seem to be on the assumption that LA or Atlanta wins the, their respective conference finals first. So yeah, that that's the thing. That's what everything that you just said could be completely. Oh yeah, no, it's completely. Yeah. So I'm just saying that's because of, it could be in Utah. But that's the thing I'm saying. Yeah, Utah could if Utah um, get the bonus point win over LA, um, then Atlanta don't get any points at all. Then they'll then Utah will go second, and then it'll definitely be going to the West regardless of what happens in the East. In the East, yeah. Um, however, uh, that's the thing. I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to be as, uh, as situational yeah. as possible. That, no, that's fair. That's fair. There's multiple, there's multiple scenarios to kind of play out. Um, so obviously, you know, on the weekend, how we kind of arrived, arrived here, um, Rooney defeated Houston 54 to 19, um, old glory DC in a game that really didn't have any playoff implications, but old glory beat. Um, or sorry, Old Glory beat San Diego 38 to 29. Um, and then 
you know, the two big games with playoff implications, Rugby ATL wins 41-31 over Utah, but thanks to Christensen and Mahalo um, scoring two tries late in the game, um, you know, Utah earns a bonus point, and now we're out of reach of Austin, who lost 31-17 to their Gill brothers, Gill cousins, um, 31 to 17. So ultimately, and this is, this is kind of the thing that I find sort of fascinating because I always kind of like it in weird sp- in sports where there's that weird scenario where a team clinches a playoff spot despite losing. I always find it yeah. kind of funny. It's like, you're kind of like, you can see like the players are kind of like, Oh, like darn, we lost, but yeah, playoffs. Yeah. Woo-hoo. Um, so I think that that's kind of interesting, but I did. I wanted to ask you this, Stu. Yes. Because me and Dan briefly talked about it on an episode that you weren't on. Okay. So might as well. I have no idea if you actually listened to the episodes that you aren't on, but um, but regardless, I mean, you should support the show. I do, obviously. But you said a episode that I'm not on, and that's a lot of that's episodes. A lot of, yeah, that, that's, a that, lot. that's all the episode before I joined as well oh well not that far back i meant this all right okay okay anyway what's your question all right so i'm looking at this right now i'm gonna pull up the mlr standings just so i can get a clear visual in my head of what the standings do look like here all right so the western conference Mm -hmm. had a very fascinating playoff race i think And my question to you, and I kind of asked Dan this earlier, but it's like, let's say you're the GM of the Dallas Jackals or you're the GM of fictional hypothetical 14th team. Yeah. You get to build an MLR team from scratch. Okay. Does the playoff race between Utah and Austin impact your philosophy for how you should build a team and how you want to play. Mm. And what I'm getting at in looking at this is the entire year. So Utah and Austin both have identical nine and six records. Austin's point differential is a lot higher. They're at plus 76. Utah is at plus 37. Right. The entire year though, Right, we've been saying it's like Austin has the best defense in the league. Yeah. Right. Or at the very least, it's between Austin and rugby ATL. Yeah. Right. The teams that have, have been highly touted as the two best defenses in major league rugby. Yeah. Utah has been on the other end of the spectrum where they're kind of with LA as the teams that are like these are like the juggernaut offenses. Yeah. Right. And now, so my question to you is if you're a GM, are you looking at this being like, do we want to play defensive or do you want to play offensive? Or like, what kind of style does your team want to play? Because looking at this, identical nine and six records, the difference, but Utah is able to clinch a playoff spot ahead of Austin for the sole reason that they score tries. And they score a lot of tries. Mm-hmm. Right. Look, you look at this, like, for example, this game that they actually clinched the playoff spot in. Yeah. Right. They lose, they give up 41 points. Not great yeah. defense. They gave up 41 points. Yeah. Right. But they still managed to score 41 or 31, right? Yeah. Five tries. Yeah. Right. Pretty good. Right. Austin, on the other hand, has been a team where it's like they win, they've won games, you know, like 17, 12. Right. Like they're limiting the tries, but they're not, they weren't scoring. It did change a little bit toward the end of the season. They did kind of get better. But the point that I'm trying to make is you got maybe one of the best offensive teams in the league or up there, which is why they're making the playoffs. One of the best defensive teams in the league up there, the same record. But at the end of the day, the way the bonus point structure works, you get bonus points for tries and you get bonus points for losing by less than seven. Yeah. You get bonus points for offense. You don't get bonus points for defense. So does that impact how you would want to build your team 
looking at the way that this played out. And furthermore to that, we still have one more week of the regular season here, right? So there is a scenario in which Utah is, because Utah's already clinched, they're six points clear of Austin. So depending on how the games play out this week, there is a scenario where Austin is going to miss the playoffs having a better record than Utah because Utah scores tries. So you're the GM of Dallas. Are you like, are you looking at this being like, this, I, how I, do we build a race team? to 50? Okay. Or are you looking <laughs> at this being like, you know what? Atlanta had good defense too when they won their conference. Yeah. How, how, like, does it, does that, so, does seeing that, because to me, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking the standings, like, you know, there's that saying that defense wins championships. Yeah. Right. But I'm looking at the way MLR is structured. I'm saying defense may win championships, but it looks like right now offense wins playoff races and you got to yeah. win the playoff race before you can win the championship. Yeah. So, so know, what are your thoughts? So I'm just looking into more detail because um, on the MLR website, it just has bonus points. It doesn't do the breakdown of mm-hmm. what those bonus points are. But on the wiki, it says that um, so Utah has six bonus points more than Austin. Yeah. Um, so Austin have seven try bonus points and three losing bonus points. Utah has four losing bonus points and 12 try bonus points. Right. And, and uh, they, they have more try bonus points than LA. Yeah. And that's and but that's so, so the this is, so this is, and making the playoffs and not. So, this is the way I look at it is that, um, because I'm as the GM of, uh, the Montreal MLR team because it's got to be in Canada. Is oh, where my MLR team is. The, the Montreal Hardies? So, yeah, why not? Gil Mon- Hard, Gil Hardies. There the, you go. The Mon- Montreal Hardy Boys. Go with the uh, go with the no- novel reference. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely not the wrestling reference. Um, oh, oh. Any, anyway, anyway, anyway. To the point. You guys can the, play for like a tag team belt. Yeah, well, we'll have belts as our championship. <laughs> anyway, the point I'm getting at is um, looking at like more of the details along the way. Um, is that you look at Atlanta and they have 102 uh, point difference plus 102 positive point difference as opposed to Utah that only has 37. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Austin, uh, not Austin, um, Utah have scored. Uh, more tries, but they've conceded. So uh, Utah have scored 66 tries, but have conceded 60, as opposed to Atlanta that has scored 55 tries and only conceded 38. Mm-hmm. So, and then you look at um, Atlanta, and they are um, they're ranked first in their conference. They've got more points at 15 games than Utah have. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you can look at like LA as well and say, oh yeah, LA has great attacking. They have the highest point differential of the league of 245. Um, and then there's also like circumstantial things as well. So Utah get to play Houston twice as opposed to the Eastern teams getting to play once. Um, so what I would be doing if I was GM is that who I would be scouting. I I would be scouting um, the big guys up front, able to like shut down any. T- so I'm going to say, if I had to flip the coin, I'm, I'm going to be more defensive because you want to be more defensive. St- still, uh, you still want to be more defensive. Yes, because I think it's the overall impact it will have uh, for the team will be. You want to keep though. You want to keep that point differential down. You want to keep. Um, those tries as few mm-hmm. as possible against you um, and it's now obviously LA seem to have one of the best the best attack but also one of the best defenses as well they've only yeah that's conceded. that's probably the ideal combination yeah <laughs> uh, and that's the thing is that I have a feel obviously for LA um, they said Adam Ashley Cooper and Matt Gitter they're only there in a one year uh, contract and I think this is going to be their uh, if they do win the championship what a swan song it is to end on um but then you also have um a lot of the guys that uh, came to la from gordon may also be going back to australia to join the waratahs with um 
Um, yeah, yeah we, sp- so, we sp- so yeah so that's it it's all it's all circumstantial i think but i think but i have to agree is that um when you look at like some of the best teams not only in mlr but also in like uh super rugby in the premiership in the uh united rugby championship is now is that the teams that do well are the teams that have the best defense the teams that don't allow their opponents to get that five bonus point Mm-hmm. So um, now I will. Agree. The thing is that um, defense wins championships is the flip side of the coin because the first um, the line preceding it is that tries put um, butts in seats. So try sell tickets. <laughs> hey, um, and Utah, Utah had a sold out game. Um, yeah, you know, congratulations for them. So, so yeah. yeah, maybe uh, I think maybe Utah's onto something there too. So yeah, it, so obvi- now obviously we do want to have like the LA situation. We want to be scoring loads of tries whilst and ensuring not. our opposition don't have any. Yeah. Um, so just, no, yeah. yeah, like for the honestly, for the most part, I agree with you. I I tend to like the defensive the defensive teams. I love you know I love the way the Springboks play. I think that's a major reason why they're like the world champions because they, you know, they're they're one of those teams that it's like they can give you the ball and just be like, here's the try line. I dare you to score. Yeah, and, uh, most of the time, the other team doesn't score. Um, so I think I think that works out well. I just think, to me, it, it is one of those things that it's, and and I know like Major League Rugby obviously uses you know a very common structure for bonus points in the standings um, across multiple rugby competitions around the world, including the Rugby World Cup. It's just I think, you know, it's one of those things. That it's it's funny to, to me that it's like I I think I think. I agree with what you're saying in the sense of like defense, but you know, sometimes I look at like the standings like this and I'm just like, you don't get bonus points for playing defense though. And it's, it's an interesting consideration to me now, especially um, uh, looking at the actual tiebreakers too. Um, So let's say in that hypothetical world where, you know, Austin wins next weekend and um, Utah and uh, Utah loses. So the first tiebreaker is most wins from all matches so in that scenario, Utah or Austin would win that. The second um, tiebreaker is highest aggregate points difference from all matches. Austin wins that tiebreaker. And the next one's most tries, which Utah would win. Um, so one of those things is like you own the standings too. Like the, like the thing that's the thing that really put Utah in the playoffs is I think tries because it's like, you know, if, if all things were equal, um, you know, if it was just nine, if it was just like nine and six or 10 and six records being put up together, right. Without that bonus point, And it was just, you just got wins for points. Right. Um, it would come down to Austin winning those tiebreakers without the bonus points that, uh, you know, Utah actually managed to, to come out with. So I don't, I think it's an interesting consideration, but I think we've, uh, but yeah. Um, but I do agree with your, your point on defense though. So, uh, other exciting things, though, as the season is kind of winding down, obviously we got a big ma- weekend of matches coming up, right? There's obviously the Rooney Nola game, you know, is still, you know, has playoff implications. The Austin LA game, I think, is fascinating because we know it's the West final. But, you know, prep is still underway for a big thing that happens after the season, which is the draft and Major League Rugby. Um, I thought big improvement over last year i thought they did really well to release this um i was a big fan of but they released 40 names on you know their dra- a draft prospect list um every all players just listed alphabetically um so there's no no like rankings or anything associated with it um so that'll maybe you don't know, be on people like us or you know media in general to kind of you know i guess you know, figure out like where, where we think guys are going to end up going or who should go first overall and whatnot. To be honest, it's a bit of a blind spot for me, especially, I don't know a whole lot about us collegiate rugby. So I was kind of look forward to some of the other content that other folks put out during this time, um, just to kind of learn more about the players. But um, the one thing I kind of wanted to focus on Stu uh, was just that there were 10 Canadians on that list of players submitted for the draft um and you know uh, one thing that i kind of did like to see too is there's two players um leon mcgukin and zach um shirt left um who are from the ocaa um so the collegiate ranks 
um, Magu- uh, McGuckin, McGuckian is, I'm sorry, dude, I'm probably butchering this guy's name. Oh, well. Um, but he's from uh, Seneca, and then uh, shirt left is from Humber College. Um, so um, so it, it kind of nice to see that. I think, so. I think for me, like a lot of times, I think rugby in Canada, I think we're kind of kind of get a little bit of a youth sports university level focus. And, you know, like you said, it's, uh, you know, rug, rug, you're not, nobody plays rugby to make a ton of money on in, in this country or on this continent. So, um, you know, it's, you know, education and stuff is still important. And at the like college and university kind of provides two different styles of education too. And uh, one style might be better for somebody than another and shouldn't necessarily let that dictate their ability to, you know, go pro or make a national team or anything like that. So it's nice to see a couple of the collegiate guys, um, you know, names pop up there. Other names, um, Alberta Montilla from UBC, Dante Williams from Toronto, um, Ewan Lawton from Bishops, handful of U Ottawa guys, James Fleming, Samuel Mace, um, Wahid Hamadi uh, are all in there too. Um, then we got uh, Mahendi Molina from the University of Montreal and Michael McTeague or McTigh, um, from the, the uh, University of Lethbridge. Um, so handful of uh, Canadian prospects kind of going in. Um, Stu, any kind, any kind of thoughts on uh, on the Canadians? You know that have put their name forward in the draft. I know might be might be tough to really an- analyze guys considering nobody's seen anybody play for over a year. But yeah, well, like obviously my knowledge of uh, North American collegiate athletes is even worse than yours. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, but three guys. Hopefully it's not as bad as my name pronunciation, though. So, uh, I will say one good thing um, that the draft list has is it's not for every athlete, which I can understand, but they also include their Instagram link. But the yeah, idea well, being uh, that you yeah. can then see the highlight reel. I now I would say if um, play it now, some players may not have a YouTube link or Instagram link, but obviously having those there means that. Um, even just as fans, we can just like click it and be like, oh, this guy in this position is of course this. Yeah. So I think that's great, especially for like the casual fan to Dude, be I like think... so yeah, they're definitely stepping up when it comes to um uh, yeah. audience outreach and audience interaction as well. So I don't know, because obviously the draft this year is gonna be on a Thursday. Mm-hmm. Um we are Obviously, because the season's still going on, we don't know what the format's going to be, if it's going to be similar to last year, or if they're going to try and do a bigger think, thing of it. Did they not say it was the same thing? I think they added a round. That came out like a uh, couple months ago. Uh, by, by that, I mean in terms of presentation. Oh, so, in terms of presentation. Oh, sorry, sorry. So will they hire like studio space, or are they going to do more okay, yeah, things? Sorry. But, sorry, sorry. So, nope, that's my fault. Um, so, yeah, we... Um, I'm also just looking at like all the players, um, their different positions. There's a lot of uh, guy. There's one, two, three, four, five um, hookers. Uh, there's five open side flankers, five scrum halves as well. Uh, although the most uh, popular category at the moment is wing. Um, so, you know, uh, six um, wingers currently in 12. But that's the thing. We're only at 40 names. They're expanding the yeah. uh, list every week. So it could be by the time that we do get to the draft in like a couple of weeks' time, we have over 100 names. It's something I think is an, it's an improvement from last year where it's like, oh, yeah. you know, I think, you know, unless you were, you know, really in tune with the collegiate rugby scene, I think the draft, the draft for me, and you may, maybe I'm just speaking like from a personal level here. The draft for me was my first like exposure to the vast majority of those players. Um, and, you know, seeing how well they performed and stuff this year makes me excited for the draft now yeah. because it's like I've seen how I've seen that the, the OK, the, there are guys that are able to just jump in and play and play well in Major League Rugby. So I think it's um, it's overall exciting um, for the league. Nice to see Canadian guys get involved in stuff, too um hopefully everybody has our you know nobody has issues and stuff going to teams south of the border if they get drafted by them um yeah. but anyways we gotta anyway, move on some so, new, some so we're talking about potential updates here yeah there's a uh, big new changes but 
So we, we may have new players for 2022, but we've definitely got uh, some new coaching structures. So down in Houston, um, out of what I can only describe as nowhere, <laughs> came the big announcement that uh, from next year, Houston's director of rugby is going to be, oh, now I'm going to butcher a name now, Henke Meyer. Yeah. And, you know, um, coach with the uh, Springboks, obviously has a long decorated history. Um, Most famously, the guy that lost to Japan at the 2015 World Cup. And then took that team. Sorry, sorry to, to bring you fourth. down a little bit, Mr. Mayor, but. So I'm just going to go. He's um, been. Yep. He was the head coach instead of South Africa from. Yeah, that's what I said. He's, he's the guy that lost. Uh, previously, he was at Stade Francais, most recently 2018 2019. Um, he's been with the Tigers. He's been with the Blue Bulls as um, head coach and assistant coach since uh 2000 the blue balls were good with 2007. um he was also the forwards coach of uh, south africa um between 99 and 2001 he's been the forwards coach in Stockton. so obviously um lots of experience of being a head coach but also the experience of being like the forwards coach as well mm -hmm. which um, needs <laughs> absolutely but you still um, need everything for the roster. yeah yeah, so that's anyone who's good. But that's it. He's as director of rugby. And the wording of the press release indicated that um, he'd be in charge of overseeing rugby as a whole, which gives the impression that there'll be another announcement within the next few months of a new head coach for uh, the Sabre Cats. And all things considered, this has to be an improvement. I mean, when when you're the lowest team in the league, oh, you can only yeah. go up. Um, yeah. In other terms of um, an actual confirmation of a head coach is that Stephen Hoyle, Steve Hoyles, will become the head coach of LA from 2022 onwards. He signed a three-year contract mm -hmm. as well, whilst Darren Coleman uh, will be heading uh, back home to join the Waratahs. Um, and obviously, Hoyles has obviously had um, success uh, this year from being uh, an assistant coach with LA. And it'll probably be a case of um, the Guiltinis will hire a new uh, assistant coach to replace him in that position. But yeah, big changes on the horizon already. And we're not even at the end of the season. Yeah. So it's nice. It's fun. Off season's already fun, man. Um... Mayor joining Houston, obviously, that's huge for their club. That's huge. I think that's one of those things that's like that's huge for Major League Rugby too. Yeah. Um. You know, we've always talked about you know I guess how guys like Gitto and Ashley Cooper, you know, Nanu, Bastero, Foden, you know, all all the big names that have come over. Um. You know, the Beast, of course, as well, that have come over. You know, however temporary their stay may have been, especially for some of those twenty twenty guys. Um. I forgot Rob Shaw in that little stretch of names too, but, um, but like, you know, all those guys that have come over, it's like, we've talked about how, like, you know, it, it does kind of look good on the league as far as like in, you know, in the rugby community and stuff to see like these legends going over. And I think it's kind of the same thing. It's like, you know, maybe, maybe other coaches see that mayor goes, goes and coaches in major league rugby. And they're like, Oh, like, you know, that could be a big opportunity for me too. Then um, obviously Coleman uh, kind of, you know, parlayed coaching a successful MLR team into a job in super rugby. So, um, you know, it, it'd be cool. It's cool to see like if the, the league grows and develops into, cause this into like a league where it's like, you know, this is like, could be like a bit of a destination for coaches or a place that coaches want to go. Um, and even like to see even like, it's not like Maris taking over like Atlanta or something. Yeah. It's like he's going to a bad team. Um, so it's, uh, <laughs> But like, I mean, a bad team that does have a lot of their a team that has a bad record, especially a team that has season. a bad record. Yes, a team that has the best stadium in the league and a lot of really cool off off field stuff and like their business side. Um, but yeah, just a bad record on the field. Um, Steve Hoyles becoming the head coach of LA. Um, you know that just makes sense. Yeah, right. It's um, you know, to have. You know, it's it's that's a, that's one that just makes sense. Promoting the assistant coach that you've had success with, and you know, led the team to probably finishing first overall. And yeah. you know, who, following, following the All Black model. Yeah, exactly. It makes promote sense. from within. It makes sense, but 
Stu, we got to wrap up here. So All right. one last week of regular season predictions here. And then I guess uh, so a couple of games. So Dan's not here, but he did give me the picks. And I, I will take this moment to apologize to uh, on Reddit, our friend, the user oddball gentleman who, you know, does that awesome, uh, I guess, makes that awesome image of all the various podcasts and MLR media's picks. Um, I have been kind of dropping the ball for him by neglecting certain picks and not remembering to put them in. Um, so I would like to apologize to him, but thank you for listening to uh, to the podcast. Um, we appreciate you, oddball gentlemen, and um, thank you for the, you know the work that you're doing on Reddit. Um, so I'm going to make sure I'm going to make a special point just for the gentleman to say every single one of Dan's picks right now so up first the battle for the wooden spoon which is technically i think tomorrow night so this game might actually be over by the time i actually finish getting this ready to be released so who's gonna finish last are we what do we what do we pick here who's gonna finish last or who's gonna win this game uh Um, let me let me check because because i may have to burst your bubble there i was gonna say you houston's last no matter what is yeah, I, I think it's like what I think there's like a six point difference. What a shame! Oh well. Oh no, it's worse. It's eight points. Oh good lord! All right. So, okay. the Seattle Sea Wolves, the Houston SaberCats. Dan has selected the Seattle Sea Wolves. Stu, who are you taking? I'm gonna have to go with Dan on this one. Um, Houston, obviously, gonna be starting a rebuilding phase. And especially after Seattle's performance against Nola Gold. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to. And at home as well. Yeah, it's, it'll be a Thursday, so maybe it won't be as busy or yeah. as loud. But still, home advantage. I've got to go Seattle. Um, yeah, I think there's uh, there's absolutely no reason to uh, pick Houston in this game. Um, it makes no sense. Um, so for that exact reason, I'm going to do it. Well, there's still maybe one of us that uh, picks Houston, and that is, of course, the two name. Well, no, I just said I'm picking Houston. It makes no sense. There's no logical reason for it. But I think Dan's still beating me on the record thing. I know we kind of looked it up last week, but we were missing weeks and stuff. But that's that's the thing. Derek, you're doing this more out of spite against Dan's picks rather than logic. I have said the whole – like all season, all the time, how cool your kits are. Just reward me once. (laughs) <laughs> just reward me reward me for it once i'm putting my faith in you one more time just one more right. time i'm like oh and seven picking houston so one one time man one one time guys so, okay uh, Nick uh, Holden Brand, get it done for me as always we're doing heads for home tails for away so seattle versus houston the toonie has picked houston nice let's go toonie all right all right, next up, we have New Orleans versus Nola Gold for the final spot in the East. And right. Dan has picked New York. Dan has picked New York. See, I'm going to pick New York too because in all honesty, we know what the scenario is for this game, right? New York can't get a bonus point and Nola has to win by 20. Yeah. So, and in all honesty... I don't really care what the result of this game is. The winner of this game is the team that is in the playoffs. Yeah. So if, if Nola wins 18, nothing, New York wins this game. Yeah. That's how it works. Yeah. So because like the scoreboard at uh, where are they playing? They're playing in New York. Yeah. Playing the in New York. Scoreboard at the start of the opening kickoff should just have 20 written on Rooney's side because that's all that matters in this game. Yeah. Right, it's not enough for Nola to win. Right, Nola's got to. We all know the scenario. Nola has to win by twenty. Yeah, if they don't. Do, if they don't win by twenty, they lose. So I'm yes. saying, even if technically they can win this game, but we all know morally they lose if they don't win by twenty. It makes yeah. no sense. So, so you're saying New York? I'm going to say New York because. Okay, so just to clarify for people at home, the team that actually wins is the team that scores more points. In that game, in that game, yes, but I'm and, yes, and that's it. Nola, and if Nola win by 19 nil, 
they wouldn't be in the playoffs, but they would still win that game. Yes, just that is correct. <laughs> just the clown. So, um, but again, this now this is a fiction. I never said my logic made sense, but New York, New York wins this game as long as they don't lose. New York it. gets the moral victory. Yeah, no, they by... get the actual victory. They're in the playoffs. <laughs> it counts for it counts for more. Okay, because I just want to confirm which week it was. If this. Was oh the... yes, uh, um, Nola slaughtered New York. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then again, that was also was in the. Lot. That was in the second week, and that was in uh, New Orleans. Yeah, no, it, yeah, it was by a lot. So, yeah, so it was by a lot. Our and New York did get the bonus point in that game, I think. Well, it's no all by two. It. They got twenty. So, but that's the thing is that I think that even if Nola put in the points, ramp it up, they have all the guys they need, win by thirty or something. New York would still get. The lose the try bonus point or the losing bonus point and just end them. So I'm going to be contrarian. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to pick Nola. I think I think that they were going to go out and they're going to win, but they're not going to get into the playoffs. If that makes sense. Yes. Which means they uh, lose. By the way. Yeah. So they win, but they lose. They win the game, yes. but they win the battle, but lose the war. Yes. Exactly. Right. Yes. Okay. Now the Tooney picks again. Heads for New York, tails for New Orleans. And the Toonie has gone for New Orleans. Nice, nice. All right. Up next, we got Old Glory DC coming off a big win versus the Austin Gilgronies coming up a little bit short of the playoffs. Stu. Our friend Dan, who could not be here tonight, has chosen Austin because he has, I guess, is too scared to pick any of the non-favorites. So, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, Austin will want to end the se- uh, the season on a high. Mm-hmm. Um, DC have already got their um, losing streak broken after beating San Diego. So, I am... Um, also going to say that Austin will just overpower them mm. and they'll take the victory. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I think I'm going to... Uh, yeah, I mean, Aust- you know what? Austin should win this game. Um, DC's home, correct? Yes, DC is the home. Oh, so that means Austin is wearing the atrocious white-on-white jerseys. Um, yeah. So for that reason alone, I'm going to pick DC. All right. <laughs> Okay, and the Toonie is going to pick DC as well. DC, nice. All right, man, me and the Toonie are on the same wavelength here. Okay, so we have have the uh, conference final a week early where we have Utah versus LA. Yeah. And Dan has picked the Giltinis. And before... Derek, before I get uh, your call, we're going to hear what the Toonie has to say. Uh-huh. So heads for Utah, tails for Los Angeles. And the Toonie has gone with Los Angeles. Nice. All right, so this to me, just because in the East, I know there's an actual playoff spot on the line in the East, but the fact that Nola has to win by 20 makes it a little bit less interesting to me unless they get off to like a big lead early or something. Um, so... I think this is the game of the week just because Utah and LA will have to play each other again the following week in the Western Conference final. Mm. So it's an interesting preview. It'll be interesting to see what the coaches do with the lineups if anybody gets arrested or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I am, you know, just to spite Dan um, and for no actual logical reason, but I know I have to catch Dan. Um, I'm just going to, they're at home though. So it works. I'm going to I'm going to go with Utah and just because is it can can LA actually go a full season without losing to a team in their own conference? Maybe, maybe not. But we'll find out. So, Utah. All right. I am going to pick LA. I think I think LA can go an entire season without losing to a team in that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. It seems so. Um, 
How interesting yeah. is it though that LA has lost to all three teams that can still make the playoffs in the East? Yeah, that it, <laughs> it that is going to be That'll delicious be if they make it to the final. It's in the uh, Coliseum, and then yeah. uh, Atlanta, New York, or Nola just on the floor with them. That the final could be in Utah. It could be, but that's if LA win the yep. uh, all um, right final. Okay, so last game. So last so, game. I guess it's the last game of the regular season. Last game of the regular season in a brand new stadium. Brand, yeah, brand new stadium, right? Be some some endings or also beginnings. So we got the New England Free Jacks versus Rugby ATL. Uh, Dan went with Rugby ATL. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay. Uh, Stu, so, what do you think? So I'm just gonna quickly see what the inverse of this fixture was because I have a feeling it was I think Rugby ATL won. I think it was Rugby ATL won. But... I'm just assuming that because they only lost four games. So uh, so yeah. Um, um, but yeah, ATL um, won I think... 33 to 18. Yeah. See, I think the smart thing to do here is to pick Rugby ATL. Straight up makes the most sense. It does. It genuinely makes the most sense. Is that why you're not going to pick them? Yeah, because I still have to catch Dan. And he picked them. So <laughs> the only way I'm catching Dan is I got to pick opposite of Dan, yeah. and and uh, I have to pick opposite of Dan, and um, yeah, and in order to in order to catch him, so we might as well make this interesting. All right, so Derek, you're going for New England. I will go for ATL, and that means the final pick, of the final game of the regular season, will be decided by the two new. Heads for New England, tails for Atlanta. And the Toonie has picked Atlanta. Nice, nice. Well, there you have it, man. It's almost, uh, I guess we'll find out what the actual records are, I guess, soon. But uh, Yeah, I, I'm not thinking I've done great. Yeah, no, no, me and Dan kind of looked at it, man. You, uh, the t- I think, yeah, you were, uh, you had a rough go. Um, yeah. But I think Dan Dan was like missing weeks or something. He said that he would have it ready. Remember when he said he would have it ready like f- three weeks ago? And he's, um, wait, um, he's just too busy for us, man. Yeah. Too, too busy. It's a shame. Um, So, yeah, it should be exciting. Like I said, I think we're going to know the winner of Seattle-Houston probably before this is out. So maybe I'll uh, send a tweet or something just to let everybody know what our picks are. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think that uh, that about kind of wraps it up. So we got a uh, end of the uh, end of the UK tour, end of the Arrow season. Um, you know, start of the playoffs, a little bit of the draft. So, you know, got a little bit of reflection and a little bit of uh, looking forward in this episode. Yeah, well, next time I'll be on the show, we'll be uh, previewing the championship final, wherever that may be. It could no. be in LA, yeah. could be in Atlanta, could be no. in Utah or New York. But that all depends on this. Week. Who knows? Anyway. Who all we know is that it will be in Toronto for 2022. Absolutely. That's the only thing I can guarantee. Um, anyway, we're going to leave this here tonight. Just want to say thanks again to Derek and Dan. Uh, glad that you're uh, listening to this podcast as well. Um, and you can find us on all social media at La Rouge Rugby. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And you can even email us at La Rouge Rugby Podcast at gmail.com. Derek, thanks for your time. And I'll see you in two weeks and Dan will see you next week.